introduce uh, Dr. Sylvia Manche Manchebo. Uh, Dr. Manchebo is an assistant professor of clinical dermatology at Weill Cornell Medicine and an assistant attending dermatologist at New York Presbyterian Hospital. She has a special interest in cutaneous oncology and will certainly add to the growing interest in um, of our group of faculty members who have an interest in the evaluation and treatment of skin cancer. And this um, topic comes up at, the, at a fantastic time when uh, we are hearing so much about um, sun protection and the dangers it can cause. So we welcome you, Dr. Manchebo. This is um, a real honor to have you speak to us today. So thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, I am absolutely honored to be speaking to um, our Wild Cornell community about um, sunscreen and how to use them in a healthy manner and how to prevent sunscreen. So today my lecture is really gonna be focused on some of the myths and controversies that surround sunscreen. Um, and really the question is, can you really enjoy the sun without fear? Um, so I have um, no disclosures of, uh, to, to, to give me one second here. I'm having a few issues with our presentation. There you go. I have no financial disclosures, no conflicts of interest to report. Um, and today really our outline, we're going to talk about the skin cancer epidemic. Um, we'll talk about the three major types of um, skin cancers that affect us, um, basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and melanoma. We'll talk about primary prevention of skin cancer, and then we'll kind of wrap up with some of these myths and controversies that surround sunscreen use. Um, so sunscreen is a major health epidemic. Um, so, um, in 2014, Dr. Boris uh, Lushniak it was the U.S. Surgeon General and really called to action um, that we really need to be preventing skin cancer. So, if you look at a historical graph here, um, you'll see that from 1994 to 2012, skin cancer um, uh, uh, sort of... Um, Sorry, I'm getting um, some of the admins for the waiting room. So, Judy, one second. Okay, so skin cancer has really skyrocketed from 1994 to 2012. So, we can see the incidence has really increased. If you combine all other cancers together, it's really much higher the amount of skin cancers that we're diagnosing. And um, really, when you're looking at this graph, it's looking at the three major types of skin cancer, so basal cell, squamous cell, and melanoma. So again, these are the main three. They account for 99% of skin cancers, and they can look quite varied, but these are the three pictures that I decided to present. Um, we can lump them into non-melanoma skin cancers and melanoma. Um, non-melanoma skin cancers really include basal cell carcinoma, um, squamous cell carcinoma, and then separately melanoma we'll discuss. So basal cell carcinoma is by far the most common skin cancer. Um, we don't have an actual estimate as to how many skin cancers are diagnosed every year because we don't keep track in any such sort of registry. Um, but we do know that there's a relationship to chronic UV exposure um, and really any ethnic background can be affected. It's a lot more common in, in white individuals, but here I have an image of what it can look like in individuals that are of darker skin tone. Um, really, it's a curable form of skin cancer. So, you know, occasionally when I do have to have this conversation with patients, I tell them that it almost never spreads to other organs. It's a low grade um, type of skin cancer and doesn't travel to the lymph nodes and has a very, very favorable prognosis. Um, once it's excised or cut out, or if you decide on a, a different type of treatment with your dermatologist, it tends to be curable. Okay? Squamous cell carcinoma has a very strong relationship to chronic UV exposure, and UV meaning ultraviolet light. It's the second most common type of skin cancer, and again, any ethnic background can be affected. However, individuals that are of Caucasian or white 
um, tend to have a stronger relationship with chronic UV sun exposure. Um, individuals that are of Black um, ethnicity um, tend to, it, this condition tends to be associated either with non healing ulcers, other kind of chronic forms of inflammation. It is also considered to be a treatable form of skin cancer um, because once we remove it from the skin, um, it has a very favorable prognosis um, and rarely spreads to other organs or lymph nodes, but it can happen with this condition. Melanoma is the least common form of skin cancer and sort of the more scary one, right? Um, it's a lot more common in individuals who are white um, and there's a relationship between severe sunburns in childhood in particular and chronic sun exposure. These tend to increase the risk um, of developing melanoma in the future. It can be considered curable if it's caught early, particularly if it's um, what's considered in situ or um, still contained to the top layer of the skin. Um, but with that said, it can be the most serious and this type of skin cancer can travel to other organs, um, including the lymph nodes, and it can be life-threatening if it does spread. Um, we know that UV radiation um, is really the only preventable um, cause of skin cancer. So some of these other reasons why individuals develop skin cancers, um, sometimes we don't have a lot of control over, such as our genetics and our inheritance. Um, but UV exposure is something that we can do something about. Um, and there are two types of exposures that are considered carcinogenic. Um, or harmful to our health. And that's solar uh, radiation, meaning UV radiation coming from the sun and UV emitted, emitting uh, tanning devices. And these are devices that we expose ourselves to either through work or um, recreationally with tanning booths, for example. Um, but I often get the question of, um, you know, we need to have a healthy balance with sun exposure, right? There are some benefits um, to sun exposure, for example, um, it can help reduce vitamin D. You feel good when you're outside getting um, exercise or walking around, getting some fresh air, and it does release endorphins, as you can see here. Um, but the downsides of sun exposure are various, including DNA mutations that increase the risk for skin cancer and sort of lead the pathway to um, potentially developing some of these um, malignant neoplasms that I discussed previously. Um, also aging and wrinkling and dispigmentation of the skin. So we really need to figure out what, how much sun we can get and what's healthy versus what's not healthy. But we know that this amount of sun is not healthy, right? So just laying out for hours and really getting a great tan, as they say, is really not a healthy way to get sun exposure. Um, and also using tanning devices, which has been um, banned in many places. Uh, sun. Um, and oftentimes the first thing that comes up is like, we use sunscreen, right? Let's use sunscreen to sort of help um, prevent, you know, skin cancer, prevent sunburns and protect ourselves from the sun. But I just want to take a step back and remind us that there are many ways that we can protect ourselves from the sun and it's not just sunscreen. So first, um, seeking shade, right? Avoiding the sunniest hours. So limiting the amount of direct sun exposure during the times of the day with the highest UV radiation. That's usually between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. And there are many ways that you can do this. Um, you can, you know, get an umbrella. Um, you can try to find a tree or some sort of other um, area that's a little bit more shaded. Um, and if you're out on the beach, then use something like, like these ladies are using to sort of help protect themselves from the sun. Second, um, clothing, right? Ideally clothing that is UV protected. So you can find clothing now that says UPF or UV protecting factor. Um, and these are specially weaved um, textiles that help Re, uh, repel the sun or, or um, sort of help protect you from sun exposure. Um, and this is very interesting because the more sun, the more skin that we show, the more sun, the more tan, and there's, and potentially the more melanomas. And there's this uh, journal article from 2014 that sort of looked historically at the way that individuals dressed, trying to find a correlation between the, the way that we're dressing, um, especially on 
uh, vacations and sunny outings, um, and potentially uh, skin cancer or the development of melanoma. And they did find that over time, we have been kind of exposing ourselves a lot more to the sun directly. Um, so this is back in 1920 you know, about, and this is how these individuals used to go to the beach. So they were very covered up. They had you know, a lot less sun um, damage and a lot less uh, skin cancer per se. And there are ways that we can do this. We don't have to dress that way now. Um, there are clothing, um, particularly this brand called Cooley Bar that is geared towards helping um, individuals kind of cover up and, uh, and enjoy the sun in a more healthy way. Um, so you can find different types of uh, clothing that can help you do that. Um, children also need to be protected. So um, wearing kind of long sleeves, um, covering the, the trunk, the extremities if you can um, to protect from the UV light. Um, other things that we can do to help protect from the sun is um, putting on a wide brim hat. And again, wide brim so that it can protect circumferentially from the sun. So the back of your neck as well as some of your shoulders should be protected in your neck area. And sunglasses to protect our eyes from UV radiation. And then lastly, but you want a broad spectrum SPF of 30 or higher water resistant sunscreen. Um, but sunscreens are a major source of confusion and debate, as you can see here from these many articles. Um, and often the question is, um, is it safe for my health? Am I using the right sunscreen? Is it the right vehicle? Am I using enough? Is it safe for the environment? Will it really prevent skin cancer? I am just so confused and I get into these type of conversations every day with my patients. So let's go through some of these controversies. So the first controversy is um, asking, uh, does skin cancer uh, really decrease the risk of, um, of uh, skin cancer? Our sunscreens decrease the risk of skin cancer. And um, it's been said that over the past 50 years, we're using sunscreen a lot more, but this skin cancer, as you can see, is kind of increasing in incidence. Um, and there have been, you know, one very huge study out of um, Australia that um, randomized individuals to daily sunscreen use um, for many months and showed that these individuals um, decreased their risk of melanoma by 50%. And that's over um, a 15 month period. Um, so you can see here that the individuals in the um, yellow did not receive sunscreen versus those or received a placebo. And then those that um, are in the blue received sunscreen and there was a significant risk um, prevention here of melanoma. Um, there's also, when they looked at this cohort 10 years out, um, they did find that um, there was also a decreased risk in squamous cell carcinoma by 40%. So there was a prolonged um, benefit of having used that sunscreen, even for those months, um, that helped uh, decrease the risk of the non-melanoma skin cancer that I talked about previously. Um, the next controversy that comes up is um, is, does the sun, is sunscreen hormonally disruptive? Um, and um, the question is, um, does oxybenzone have any sort of estrogenic activity? And there's been sort of uh, animal studies, particularly in rodents, um, that show that oxybenzone can be um, absorbed and potentially cause some sort of hormonal effects on the rats. However, um, these were short-term studies um, that were done on rats. When they looked at human studies, it didn't find any sort of effect on reproductive hormones or thyroid function. Um, and we've been using um, this particular uh, chemical filter, or UVA filter, um, excuse me there. Um, and then if you look at real world evidence, right? So um, if you think about the amount of sunscreen that they, or oxybenzone that they applied on these, on these mice um, or rats, they uh, kind of covered their entire bodies and then 
uh, found that there was an elevation in uh, certain hormones. If we were to apply that to the body surface area of a human, um, even in either 25% of the body surface area with one milligram per centimeter, um, it would take about 277 years um, to get to the levels that they used in the rats. So, and if we were to cover the body 100% with an even greater application, um, it would take 35 years. And again, there's not a lot of compelling evidence that oxybenzone is actually harmful to humans. And it's really unlikely to achieve any of those um, cumulative um, doses that they were given in the, in the laboratory um, experiments. Um, the next question is oxybenzone and coral reef bleaching, right? So are we harming the environment? Um, and it's been shown to sort of bleach coral in the laboratory. Now, um, in Australia, the greatest bleaching were found in areas that were least frequented by tourists. So we have to wonder whether global warming could be potentially um, one of the major causes of, of coral bleaching. Um, second, there are other things that we can do besides using oxybenzone. So um, we can use safer sunscreens, right? Zinc oxide and titanium dioxide, these are the sunscreens that have um, mineral filters or physical barriers um, rather than chemical filters. And these are deemed safe for the, um, for the environment. Um, furthermore, I just want to go back to saying that sun protected clothing, right? So we're protecting ourselves from the sun. We can enjoy, um, you know, the ocean, the beach, et cetera, outside in a, in a more healthy manner. Next, um, we'll talk about sunscreen uh, with nanoparticles. So these have been a little bit more popular over the last years because they make for a more elegant product. Um, so they allow for us to use um, some of these titanium dioxide particles and be able to disperse them more evenly and create sort of a more sheer appearing or invisible even appearing sunscreen. Um, and this could be really um, nice and elegant for individuals with darker skin tones where um, those sunscreens that have a higher um, uh, particle size um, don't kind of go on as nicely. Um, so the concern is, you know, do these nanoparticles penetrate the skin? Do they induce free radicals when they're exposed to the UV radiation? And can they damage our cells? Um, so that was the claim by friends. EWG, which is the environmental work group, uh, very well known, um, does recommend nanoparticles um, and titanium dioxide and zinc oxide. And many, many, um, research articles have shown that nanoparticles um, do not penetrate the skin surface in healthy and intact skin. So that's nearly 30 studies that have proven this. Um, they are coated with materials to sort of limit the generation of these reactive oxygen species, which is the concern for potentially causing damage to our cells. Um, but with that said, these are not to be inhaled, and these sunscreens um, should not be applied to inflamed skin. For example, individuals with eczema or psoriasis, um, photo protection um, with different types of sunscreens would be um, ideal, or using just actually photo protective clothing would even be the best thing to do. Okay. Um, next, I want to talk about vitamin D deficiency. Um, so the concern is whether sunscreens lead to vitamin D deficiency, um, but vitamin D can be obtained in various ways, right? So ultra B, um, ultraviolet B radiation is not the only way that we get vitamin D. We can get it in our diet. We can have it in a dietary supplement. Um, so in real life settings, sunscreen use does not really decrease a lot of vitamin D levels. If you are very rig rigorous about uh, photo protection, that means seeking shade and long sleeve, sort of how we are suggesting you do, there might be an association with lower vitamin D levels. But the bottom line is that um, you shouldn't depend on the sun to get your vitamin D. And there are other more healthy ways to kind of get your vitamin D levels, right? Up. So um, you can certainly take a vitam vitamin D supplementation or take foods that are rich in vitamin D, for example, salmon, cheese, et cetera. Um, and those individuals that are super um, sun avoiders or protectors, 
um, they may suffer from lower vitamin D levels, and I do recommend that they work with their primary care to get those levels higher to a more appropriate level. Next is, um, I'm often asked, do I have to use SPF 100 or is SPF 30 enough, right? So if you think about our skin without any sunscreen, if you have 100 photons, these are energy um, from the sun, 100% um, of them will pass through. What an SPF of 30 is doing is limiting the amount of that of energy that's kind of penetrating into the skin. So with an SPF of 30 from 100 photons, your skin um, is only 3% of those photons sort of penetrate the skin. With an SPF of 100, right? So that is a 2% difference. So theoretically, it could potentially be very beneficial to use something higher. However, we know that for the most part, patients don't use enough sunscreen. So um, often what I say is you cannot overdo it. To reach the level of SPF that it says on the bottle, you need to apply a moderate or substantial amount of sunscreen to all exposed skin. So all the skin that's re receiving sunlight. Um, so you don't wanna apply too little sunscreen. So let's look at the scenario where you're not putting on enough sunscreen and you're thinking that you're protected with an SPF of 100. So really this SPF of 30 becomes more like an SPF of five if you're only using about 20 to 25% of what you're supposed to be using. And that SPF of 100 becomes SPF of, of 20 essentially. Now, um, there could be a significant difference here. Um, you know, so if you're not putting on enough of 30, then you'll end up with about 20% of those photons that pass through. Um, if you're not putting on enough of SPF 100, you'll end up with 5%. But now if you just use the right amount of SPF 30, right? The one that you use two milligrams per centimeter square where you fill a shot glass, let's say, say um, for your entire body or one ounce of sunscreen, then if you just use it properly, you get 3% of those photons passing through rather than with an SPF of 100, which you're not using enough of, which you'll get the 5%. So really what I recommend is using an SPF of 30 and use it appropriately. So lather it on, get the, get the uh, benefit of using um, the sunscreen properly rather than thinking you're protected with an SPF of 100. Um, so, but this was studied more uh, formally by our colleagues over at NYU with Dr. Regal. And they did show that SPF of 100 is technically a little bit more protective against sunburns than an SPF of 50 in the way that most individuals use it. But really what I want for my patients is to use um, the sunscreen in the right amount of doses. So if you prefer something like an SPF of 100, that is totally fine. You'll probably be more protected. Just make sure you're using enough of it. Um, sunscreen uh, controversy number seven, should I be using a spray or not? And, you know, we'll get into um, uh, sort of the benzene uh, in a minute, but experts really have a concern about aerosol, aerosolized spray sunscreens, um, you know, because it really, as you can see from these pictures, doesn't have even coating on the skin. So you still are prone to develop in a sunburn because you have this kind of um, uneven display. review, um, what we usually recommend is avoiding inhalation because you don't want to inhale uh, the particles that are in the sunscreen. You don't want to spray anywhere near your mouth and you want to spray into your hands and then kind of rub it in, right? So that will in ensure that you're dispersing uh, the chemical filters or the uh, mineral filters evenly throughout the skin. Next, uh, we'll talk about something that has been in the media quite a lot, right? So the FDA issued a recall after detecting benzene, which is a carcinogen, in 78 batches of sunscreen. So this is hot news. Um, benzene was found in sprays, in gels, in lotions containing both chemical and mineral-based formulations. We know that benzene is a uh, a very light colorless chemical. It's found, uh, we use it in laboratories, obviously. It's also found as part of um, secondhand smoke, sometimes in certain um, gasoline biparticles. So, um, 
you know, something that we know is harmful to, to human health um, has been associated with certain blood dyscrasias um, or even blood skin cancers. And Valishore, um, which is this company, sort of tested um, a bunch of sunscreens and found that 27% of samples, they did detect benzene at levels that were um, three times what is considered normal, which is two parts per million. However, I just want to emphasize that this is not all sunscreen, right? And this is not a sunscreen issue. This is a contamination issue. Um, so we know that benzene is unhealthy. There are many, many, many benzene, um, many, many sunscreens that do not contain benzene. And here I've given um, an attachment or um, a, a copy of the PDF here where you can find sunscreens that do not contain any benzene. And I would highly encourage you to use um, sunscreens from this list. Now, there are a lot of sunscreens that haven't been tested for benzene. Um, so if you want to stick to this list that doesn't contain benzene, I think it's totally appropriate. And then obviously we want to avoid the products that do contain um, benzene. And in fact, um, Johnson & Johnson recently recalled a lot of their um, spray sunscreens because they've been found to have benzene contained in them. Um, one of the last controversies I wanna get into is should black people use sunscreen? Um, and this is a question that I get occasionally. And the answer to this is actually a little complicated. Now, you know, the, um, when we advocate for using sunscreen, um, it's backed by, um, uh, by, by data, right? So I went through the data um, where the, the large clinical trials show that an intervention of using sunscreen prevented carcinomas. And um, we have a lot of lab evidence as well. But these trials, did not include uh, black individuals. Um, and also, when you look at more of a public health um, epidemiologic studies, there's really a very weak relationship or no relationship between UV exposure and skin cancer in black individuals. Um, basal cell carcinoma seems to have, um, out of all the types of skin cancers, um, a stronger relationship um, uh, to UV exposure among, among Black individuals, and it tends to be among individuals that have lighter skin tones. Um, but there's no correlation between UV uh, exposure and melanoma, and um, not a strong correlation between UV exposure and squamous cell carcinomas in Black individuals. So with that said, though, um, Black individuals can still burn. Um, skin burns or sunburns are very painful. I think they would still benefit from using sunscreen to prevent that. And in addition, um, a lot of my um, patients who are of black background um, are disproportionately affected by pigmentary disorders. These are things like melasma, hyperpigmentation, and these disorders can benefit a lot from sunscreen use. So, you know, I don't know what the right answer is yet, because I, I think we still need to study this in a lot more detail. Um, but I do think there is definitely a role for sunscreen in the Black population. It may not be to prevent skin cancer, but it may be to ameliorate some of these other disorders that they are affected by. And lastly, I get the question sometimes, is there a sunscreen in a pill? Um, and there is, so um, in a way. There is a fern extract from Central and South America called Polypodium leucotomus, and this is an antioxidant. And for me, this, is, this does not replace sun protection and sunscreen use. It is an adjunct for me for high intensity um, sun exposure. And what it does is that it lowers um, the amount of DNA mutations that you get in the skin after um, UV exposure. It also increases, it sort of gives you a natural or increases the SPF a little bit. It increases the amount of UV uh, radiation that you need to get before you get a sunburn. Um, so I often encourage some of my patients who are fair skin, um, who are diligent about their sunscreen use, but just want a little bit of extra protection to look into this product. Um, so sometimes, so I'm often asked like, doctor, what is the best sunscreen? And my, my answer tends to be, really it's the sunscreen that you're more likely to use and the one that you're more likely to use correctly. So 
is broad spectrum. That means it covers against UVA and UVB rays. It is SPF of 30 or higher, and it's water resistant. So, you know, you have to decide where your comfort level lies in the sense of some of these um, issues that I've brought up over and controversies that I've brought up over this presentation. And if you feel like you're less risk adverse, I usually recommend a mineral based sunscreen that it includes zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. Um, and if you want a little bit more of an elegant feel to your sunscreen, then some of these chemical filters do provide that in a, in a very nice formulation, um, as well as those not nanoparticles. Um, so really it depends on your personal preference. Um, lastly, I just want to acknowledge um, Dr. Michael Marchetti who gave me some insight, uh, insightful ideas and also uh, comments for this presentation. And my mentor from um, medical school and training, Dr. Steve Wong, um, who is a photobiologist and we worked together on a paper on the controversies and myths relating to sunscreen. Um, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure and I am happy to take any questions. If anyone has any questions, you can just um, put them in the chat box and we will, um, the chat box is right here and we will be able to, um, to relay them to Dr. Manchebo. Um, Victoria, I am happy to put those links um, for you. Give me two seconds here. Okay, so the first link is for the ones that contain benzene, and the second link are the is the one to the, that do not contain benzene. Sarah, can you um, just expand a little bit on your question? So you asked, are you aware of the effectiveness of the product Vanny Cream Broad Spectrum SPF 50? Um, so broad, so Vanny Cream is a very well, tends to be um, one of the brands that I resort to for individuals with sensitive skin, um, such as eczema. And um, they usually have uh, sunscreens containing um, a mineral base, but I would have to confirm that, um, that this particular product is in fact mineral um, contained, it has mineral, con mineral filters. Um, so it usually, yes, so your, your wife is asking for sensitive skin. So usually if you have, if you tend to be more on the sensitive skin side, um, Vanity Cream is a good, um, brand to sort of go to. And they do have a broad spectrum um, product and I believe is water resistant. So I, I think you'll be okay with that product. Um, I think Dr. Hi, can I Hi, Jared. Yes. Well, can I ask you one question, Doctor? Sure. Hi, uh, thank you for today. And hello, everybody. Um, I've uh, actually was in touch with your office last week. Um, I'm immune suppressed with an mm -hmm. organ transplant and uh, the aerosol issue came up last week. Mm -hmm. And your office answered me by saying that, and I think you confirmed this today, issue is a um, contamination issue and the other products by that company should not be 
um, an issue at all. Is Can you confirm that? And should we keep watching that as that progresses? Right, so there are two issues that I think you're bringing up. So there's the aerosolized issues. So there's sunscreens that um, are not, don't have benzene and are aerosol, that are aerosols. Um, those are still under FDA review. So um, generally I would recommend using more of a cream or lotion based sunscreen, okay? Um, Second is the issue that some um, aerosol sprays do contain a, a significant amount of the sprays in particular um, were identified among the 78 sunscreens that had benzene. So again, um, I would recommend kind of avoiding the sunscreens that have benzene and sticking to the ones that have um, been shown to not have benzene, um, especially if you're immunosuppressed. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, I'm sticking to, uh, of that product. So thank you very much. Sure. Oh, sorry, Victoria, um, I will get you that link. I think I sent it directly to Ed. All right, Nancy's asking, um, my son is a lifesaver. What can he do daily without overdosing as sunscreen protection capsules or something else? So big, big, big thing for individuals that are um, out in the sun a lot is just clothing and seeking shade. Very, very big on that. Um, so he should be wearing a rash guard that has UPF um, textile incorporated into it. Um, ideally, be covering his torso and extremities if he can. Wide brim hat when he's not out saving someone's life. Um, and using sunscreen and reapplying Ideally, every two hours, I would say, um, with an SPF of 30 or higher. And um, I would recommend a mineral-based sunscreen for him, again, if we're concerned about him using this over a long period of time. Okay, very good. So I just sent over, so Andy shared with you the link of sunscreens that do not have benzene, and then I also shared with you the link of sunscreens that do. So you have both lists and you can check the products that you have at home. And um, also in case you're interested in buying a sunscreen in the near future, just double check it against this list as well, okay? Are you still receiving uh, private chats, uh, Dr. Mencheva? I am not. Okay. So I know um, that uh, you have um, another meeting to go to. So I'm going to kind of put a last call out for any other questions. And I'm going to thank you very much for this. Thank you so much for having me. This was an incredibly informative lecture. And um, I want everyone to know it is going to be on the Myra Mayen um, YouTube channel. So you can watch it. Again. And um, we appreciate your um, signing up for this. I understand there were some difficulties registering. And um, but you can go back to the um, um, channel and watch it again. And we really do appreciate it, Dr. Manchevo. This was fantastic and so well-timed given everything that's going on. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And, um, you know, thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you. All right.